Uh, so the Xerces Society protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We have a number of, uh, pro of programs under which we organize this conservation work. We have a pollinator program, an endangered species program, which is the program that Rich and I work for on bumblebee issues and conservation. Uh, we have a program on aquatic invertebrates, such as freshwater mussels. Uh, we have a butterfly conservation program that is uh, heavily focused on monarch butterflies, but importantly also works on other butterflies. And we have a pesticide program. Uh, the, the butterfly in this photo is a uh, so-called blue butterfly. And I, I mention this because uh, the Xerces Society is named for one of the blue butterflies. Um, in fact, the Xerces blue butterfly is the first butterfly known to have gone extinct in the United States. Uh, and the organization was founded uh, with that, with that uh, extinction in mind and hoping to uh, avoid other such extinctions. Uh, so we do a lot of work through education, um, research, we do advocacy work. Uh, we work extensively with members of the public as well as uh, partners in and out of government. Uh, we are a science-based organization. So we work with these public agencies as well as private landowners. Uh, habitat managers to do surveys for uh, invertebrate species to work on habitat restoration. We also do a ton of work with community scientists, uh, scientists such as yourselves. So this California bumblebee atlas is one of our community science projects. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as citizen science, although we use the, the word the phrase community science. Uh, we have other uh, bumblebee atlases, including the Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas. Uh, and uh, Alice is going on in a total of 10 states in the Midwest and the Western US. Uh, we have community science opportunities uh, around uh, monarch butterflies, around the milkweeds that monarchs and other invertebrates depend on. Um, we have other community science opportunities related to ponds and other freshwater habitats. If you're interested in more community science, uh, not just in California, but throughout the country, uh, please uh, check out our website and uh, find our page on community science. And as I said, we do advocacy work and we work on policy. Uh, so this is our director, Scott Hoffman Black, testifying about an issue, a conservation issue. Uh, and so we use that, that science base to uh, inform our policy work and our advocacy work. And all of this is made uh, possible, sorry, we also do education and training. Um, so we've trained over 100,000 professionals since 2008, um, and uh, we've done this in the U.S. as well as uh, elsewhere throughout the world. Um, and uh, we've also conserved quite a, quite a large area of acreage for uh, pollinators and other invertebrates. Um, so, the, for example, through habitat restorations to bring more wildflowers for uh, those pollinators that depend on them, or to manage freshwater habitats, other sorts of on-the-ground conservation work. All of this is made possible by donors um, and uh, other funding streams. So if you're interested in supporting this work, one way to do so is to follow that link and, um, and support us. Thank you. So with that, we'll get into uh, this first module about uh, bumblebees. This is an introduction to uh, what, what bumblebees are and how they live. And it's, uh, it's about 30 minutes. And as I said, then we'll uh, take a break for questions before moving on to the second module. Um, as you see here, this is this outline will pop up once in each of the uh, four modules. Uh, we'll move right into bumblebee conservation after this with Rich. Uh, then we will talk about how to participate in the Atlas. It's a it's a step by step guide, everything you need to know about how to do this project. We will take a break for lunch at around noon, um, as close to noon as we can get it. And then at 1230, we will come back for an hour and a half of talking about how to actually identify bumblebees. So uh, without further ado, let's move forward. Um, and so I like to start here. Why, why do we care about invertebrates? In fact, why do we care about this particular group of invertebrates, bumblebees? Well, there are many reasons. And um, the first uh, is nice to summarize by this quote, the fate of the world's insects is inseparable from our own. So uh, insects and other invertebrates perform very, many uh, very important uh, ecological functions or roles in ecosystems. So for example, uh, on the bottom left here, we see a beetle that is moving dung. Uh, insects are often involved in, uh, in the process of decomposition of organic matter. 
Uh, insects are important to biocontrol in agricultural contexts. For example, this wasp, which is parasitizing an aphid. Uh, as you're probably familiar, invertebrates are often at the base of animal food chains, or maybe one rung above the base, which might be an autotroph like a plant. Right, so uh, insects are, or and other invertebrates are often the food for uh, for vertebrates and other organisms, and then uh, uh, in, invertebrates, especially uh, bees, are especially important for pollination of plants. And um, of course, we're talking about pollinators today, so we do emphasize that um, in this talk. And I want to just uh, clarify what pollination is. I think everyone uh, in the webinar probably has an idea of what pollination is, but it's good to get on the same page. Quite simply, it is the movement of male uh, reproductive parts from their uh, sites of production in flowers to female parts. So from the anthers, which is where pollen grains are produced, uh, pollen is moved to the stigma, which is the top of the female part of the flower. Now, pollination uh, can happen between those sexual parts within one flower, between flowers on the same plant, or between flowers on different individuals of the same plant species. And some pollination is accomplished by wind or other sort of passive means, but um, insects, uh, animals, and especially bees, are important as cross-pollinators. So they move pollen between flower parts when they forage for their food. Pollination is by animals is very, very important to, uh, to plants. So I like to think of pollinators as something of a keystone species. This is a concept from ecology uh, that describes organisms that uh, they play a, 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 a keystone role in an ecological system. That is without them, the system might fall apart or degrade in some way. So uh, insects uh, or uh, pollinators are responsible for um, Partial, part of the reproduction of something like 85% of flowering land plants. Uh, and that is almost always an insect. And um, as we'll see, bees are the most important of those pollinating insects. Uh, so pollinators are not only important to wild plants, they're critical to our crop production. Roughly 10% of all of uh, the economic value that comes from agriculture is due to pollination. So stated a different way, if we lose bees and other pollinators, we will still have an agricultural system, but the, the quality of the food that we can produce will change and the ultimate value to farmers and, uh, and to consumers will diminish. So food would become more expensive um, and actually less nutritious. Uh, it's really important to understand that um, of all of these bees that are important pollinators in crop production, uh, honeybees, as you'll learn uh, in a minute, are, of course, very important as crop pollinators. But on average, uh, research has found that wild bees play uh, the most important role in pollination of these agricultural crops. So these are unmanaged wild insects that are commuting to the farm to forage for their own food. And in so doing, they end up pollinating uh, the, the plants on which we depend. So uh, it's not to say that honeybees are not important in certain crops. For example, almonds uh, being pollinated uh, today in California, uh, honeybees are absolutely critical to the pollination of that crop. Uh, but we wanna recognize that wild bees uh, play this critical role in our food systems. So let's look at the major groups of insect pollinators. We have butterflies and moths, uh, flies in the top right, uh, top center, sorry. Um, um, and then the bottom left, we have a wasp, we, then to the right, beetles, and of course, bees, which uh, tend to be, which are numerically and functionally the most important uh, pollinators of wild and cultivated plants. Now, bumblebees are um, standouts in the world of bee pollinators. They're large and hairy. They depend on nectar and pollen uh, for their own survival as well as that of their larva, so for their reproduction. They have a number of adaptations to harvest and transport pollen. Uh, and in this picture, we see a bee called um, yellow-belted bumblebee or Bombus terricola. This one does not occur in California, uh, but you can see circled in red, this part of the hind leg is um, hairless and shiny. It's somewhat concave and the, the bristles around it form a sort of a basket. And uh, this is an adaptation for carrying pollen home to the nest. And um, it's one of the ways that uh, bumblebees are, import, uh, are especially good at moving pollen um, between flowers. That said, I wanna uh, say that, that pollination by bees is incidental to their need for pollen and nectar. 
It is not an intentional process where they're moving pollen between the male and female parts of the flowers. It's not altruism. It's actually more like a reciprocal exploitation where the bees are getting food, the plants are getting pollinated, and um, each partner to that interaction, that mutualism, um, is, um, is helping the other, but is also out for its own good. Uh, so I want to distinguish bumblebees from the much better, much more well-known honeybees here. Here are uh, examples of honeybee, a honeybee and a bumblebee. This is again the yellow belted bumblebee uh, on the same plant. So you can see the relative size difference. Bumblebees tend to be larger than honeybees. Uh, they tend to be hairier. They are often yellow and black and striped. Although as we'll see, they can have red or white or other color hair on them. By contrast, honeybees tend to have yellow or honey colored uh, and dark colored hair in alternating bands. Um, honeybees have hairy eyes. Uh, they, are, they have much more highly complex social uh, lives, uh, but, but bumblebees are of course social also. Uh, so honeybees uh, are not the focus of this project. And you will see a lot of honeybees when you're out in the field looking for bumblebees. And um, I think that you'll learn to distinguish the two readily, but at first it can be a little bit difficult to decide whether you're looking at the familiar honeybee or actually one of our bumblebees. So before we move further into the bumblebee world, let's just step back and look at bees around the world. So we've talked about bumblebees and we've talked about the, the Western honeybee. Um, in fact, there are many other types of bees around the world. Uh, something like just over 20,000 species have been described. In North America, that's more than 5,000. And just in the United States and Canada, 3,600 species of different types of bees. And these five images, six images here, show you a smattering of the different uh, looks of these bees. You can see that they vary greatly in the degree of hairiness, the color, the tongue length, um, some of these, perhaps the one top left, uh, are not readily distinguishable as bees to most people. Um, and so I want you to just understand that beyond bumblebees, this important group that we're working on, there is a vast array of diversity um, of bees worldwide and in, in California. So just to compare, uh, around the world, there are only about 265 species of bumblebees, uh, whereas there are some 20,000 of, of all these, right? So uh, just keep that in mind as you evaluate what you uh, think and know about bumblebees themselves. And um, I'll go quickly through this slide. There's a lot of information. All I want you to get from this is that uh, bumblebees are somewhat atypical. If we were to look across all of the bees, this pie chart shows you for the United States how the bees break out into different family groups. Don't worry about the details. I just want you to see that uh, the family that bumblebees belong to is the apidae, uh, the yellow in the, in the top right quadrant. Uh, it's relatively, uh, it's less than a quarter of all of the species. And, and bumblebees actually only represent about one and a half percent of all of the species of bees found in uh, the United States. Um, also of note, most bees are solitary, not social, and uh, bumblebees are social. So we'll talk more about that. Um, most uh, bees are ground nesting. And in fact, many bumblebees are. Um, although bumblebees can live both below ground and above ground, and there are many types of solitary bees that also live above ground in, um, in uh, cavities of various sorts. All right, so uh, this is just a picture of one of the smallest and the largest bees on earth to give you a sense of the uh, great diversity in uh, size that, that does exist. Um, and the, the following four or five pictures just show you a couple of those types of bees. Um, these are bees, both of them different species in the family Holictidae or uh, sweat bees. Um, and uh, they're, uh, they're uh, diverse and uh, common, many of them, and important as pollinators of many different types of wild flowers. Um, here we have uh, a bee in the genus Andrina, the family uh, Andrenidae. Uh, this is the mining bees. They live so-called because they live below ground. They're very diverse. Uh, many of them specialize on just a few types of pollen, so they have to have a particular type of host plant. This is another thing that uh, distinguishes some bees like this from, from bumblebees, which are generalists. Here we have a bee in a family called Megachylidae, or the leafcutter family, leafcutter bee family, 
Um, and this female is carrying a piece of leaf back to the nest. This is not food, it is actually um, structural. She's going to chew this up and perhaps mix it with a little dirt or sand. And she'll use that to make partitions and doors in her nest. This is distinctive to bees in this particular family. It's not something that bumblebees do. Uh, and here's an interesting bee. Uh, this is a more close relative of bumblebees. It's in the, uh, the group called Nomada. And these are actually parasites of other bees. They're, uh, they're bees, they're true bees, but they do not collect their own pollen. Instead, they sneak into the nests of other bees and lay their eggs and their offspring uh, grow up to parasitize, to eat the pollen and nectar that was left by the, the host and uh, sometimes to kill and eat the, the host larva also. Um, so here's, here's a bumblebee to uh, contrast with the previous photos, a bit larger, uh, a lot hairier in general. Let's get into talking about bumblebee ecology. All right, so here is a map of North America. This is from a, a field guide called Bumblebees of North America. This is a, uh, a good book for, uh, to have if you're um, participating in this, in this project. It helps you to identify the bees and um, uh, shameless self-promotion alert. I'm a co-author on the book. Uh, but this, this, these grid cells just show you the number of bumblebees found in um, each, uh, each area of the country. And as you can see, one of the most diverse areas of the continent um, is Northern California and uh, Montaigne, Sierra Nevada, uh, California. So we have something like around 25 uh, species of bumblebees in the state, and that is quite a bit more than most of the rest of the United States and Canada. Uh, so we are a biodiversity hotspot, and this um, is uh, makes it all the more important that we are uh, engaging in this project to um, better understand what's going on with, with the state's uh, native bumblebees. All right, so um, across the, co the continent, we have roughly 50 species of bumblebees. As I've said, they are social, meaning that they live in family units where there is a division of labor, where there is one reproductive bee. For example, in the center photo, you can see a larger bee. That is the queen. She is the mother of all the other bees in the nest. Um, she previously mated with a male, and um, she's the only reproductive bee there. All of the others are either worker females who take care of her and take care of the nest and do the foraging, or eventually she makes uh, males and female reproductive offspring. Uh, we can distinguish bumblebees from other uh, social uh, bees like honeybees in that they are annuals. The, the colonies only last for one growing season. So here in California, they're getting started now, let's say on the coast. Um, they may last for three to five months. And then at, at the end of that time, they have reproduced. The new uh, reproductive individuals have gone out into the world and the colony falls apart. Uh, after mating, the only bees that survive uh, to hibernate and then form colonies the next year are those queens. Um, the males die, the workers die, all of the old bees die. So uh, this is different from honeybees where they have colonies that last for several years. And the reason that honeybees make honey is actually to survive the winter time or the dearth period when they can't forage. Bumblebees don't make much honey because they don't have to do that. Bumblebee nests are quite a bit smaller than those of honeybees, uh, usually no more than 500 individuals. Uh, they can be quite a bit smaller than that. And uh, these photos give you a sense of what it looks like inside the nest. And uh, those grub-like things in the bottom right-hand image, those are actually bee larvae. And we've busted open, someone who took the photo has busted open the, the wax pot that they live in. Uh, but that is, that is baby bees on their way to becoming adults. I'll go through the life cycle of, uh, of bumblebees. So starting in springtime, we have queens who spent uh, variable amounts of time underground in hibernation. They previously mated with males. The, the summer that they emerged from their natal nest, they mated before going into a diapause or hibernation state. When they emerge in spring, they spend some time looking for food for their own sustenance, as well as a suitable nest site which will be uh, a pre-existing cavity underground. Um, they can't dig their own um, cavities underground for this. They need to find a hole, for example, a rodent burrow, um, sometimes above ground also, but uh, usually below ground. Uh, and um, then they will start to provision that nest. Eventually they will lay eggs. 
they will incubate those eggs. And uh, after those eggs turn into larva, uh, they will continue to incubate them. The larva go through several stages before they become a pupa or uh, they go into a cocoon phase. If you're familiar with, with butterflies, the common terminology there. Uh, and this remarkable transformation happens in the pupa and an adult bee emerges um, seven to 10 days later. This whole process takes about five weeks and the queen is, su is successively laying more eggs. After the first brood emerge, those, uh, those are worker female offspring and they start to do all the work. The queen just stays home and incubates and lays eggs and the colony builds uh, until uh, a point when uh, they, the colony collectively decides to stop growing larger and to start making reproductive offspring. So the colony produces females who are reproductive. Um, we call them gines at this time, but you can just call them queens if you want. And then it produces males, uh, which some people will call drones. Um, those, those guys leave the nest, they forage, they find each other and mate. And then, as I said, those gines go to, uh, they dig a short little tunnel underground, um, a hibernaculum, and they, uh, they go there and they go into a, um, a state of, uh, of hibernation where their temperature may conform to air temperature and they pretty much shut down, they're alive and they're subsisting on stored, internal stored resources like fat. Um, they can't move, they can't do anything except wait until spring. Uh, rarely, uh, these giants or queens will hibernate communally. This is uh, not typical and I'm gonna just leave it at that. You can ask questions if you're interested to hear more about that situation. Uh, so here's the life cycle in one uh, uh, pleasing illustration. This is for, um, this is depicting the rusty patch bumblebee, which is found in the Midwest and the East. Uh, and this one is listed as endangered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, so this is a temperate environment that we're depicting here, but it, uh, it serves the purpose for California. So queens will emerge in spring from their subterranean um, hibernaculum. They will search for places to nest. They will collect food. As I said, they will, uh, hi they will um, incubate those eggs in larva, um, producing successive broods of adult female worker cast offspring. Eventually they will produce those sexual reproductives, males and females. They will find each other and mate. Those giants eat a lot of food uh, to store fat and then they go to their diapause or their hibernation. Um, hibernation can last nine months or more in uh, Northern places which is uh, where many bumblebee species occur. In California, it can be only a few weeks, we think. Uh, some areas of Southern California on the coast, we believe that bumblebees probably only spend a, a month or something uh, in, a, in a diapause, in a hibernation period before they become active again. Uh, I wanna add one tantalizing detail to this life cycle. Um, and that is the existence of cuckoo bumblebees. So here's another way to look at the annual life cycle. Uh, and so here we have at the top, the bumblebees are in hibernation. And if you go clockwise, we go through that same life cycle again. Uh, there is a group of bumblebees, they're actual bumblebees that do not participate in this life cycle diagram um, as such. In instead, they find a, a host, a another species of bumblebee, they break into the nest, they use aggression and, and pheromones to subjugate the population of bees that live in that nest. Sometimes they kill the queen or some of the workers while fighting. Uh, they then uh, destroy the existing eggs and larvae, lay their own, and they stay, they stay in the nest while the workers continue to forage for the colony. And so they, they uh, end up, the colony ends up producing nothing but male and female offspring of this cuckoo bumblebee. I bring this up because we have three species of these cuckoo bumblebees in California, and we will be talking about them uh, a bit later. Um, these are real bumblebees. The, it, this sounds draconian and perhaps horrible if you care about bumblebees, but uh, please keep in mind that these are also uh, native insects, native bumblebees that occur here, and we care about their, uh, their survival and persistence also. And um, they're just a very interesting part of the whole uh, ecology of bumblebees. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, add a few uncertainties that we have about bumblebees here. Um, this is a, a research model for invertebrates. We have a ton of research on bumblebees. That said, there are notable um, gaps in our understanding that 
may uh, impact our ability to understand declines or persistence conservation needs. And so I've just ticked off a few here. We, uh, we know a lot about nesting biology, but there is much more to, uh, to come to understand. Uh, we lack resolution about what goes on underground while bees are hibernating. Um, how far do they disperse? It's pretty hard to track these guys once they leave the nest. And um, we're, we're uncertain whether they could disperse long distances or whether they're sort of, um, you know, they, they have to stay in the habitats that, they're, that their natal nest uh, occurred in. Um, it's very hard to figure out population density. Um, there's some molecular methods that have helped us understand this, but it's very hard to find the nests. Therefore, it's hard to get a sense of the density of nests and how many reproductive individuals there are in a population. Um, some basics of how males and females find each other and reproduce are, are opaque. Um, and specifically male bumblebees, we, we tend not to think about them as much. We research workers and queens um, and the ecology of being a male bumblebee is something we know relatively less about. And I would just argue that uh, it's a knowledge gap we should fill. Um, and then as you'll hear more uh, later, there are many threats to bumblebees and we know a lot about them, but uh, there is more to understand about uh, such threats as pesticides and uh, climate change. So I'll wrap up the first module here with uh, a pitch about the project. And I, you already know about the project because you're here today. Um, but um, this is one of our little pitch slides for the California Bumblebee Atlas. So if you haven't yet, you can register for the project by clicking or going to uh, cabumblebeeatlas.org. And on that screen, on that page, you will find um, access to, uh, to a registration form. And I think with that, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we could uh, have a couple of questions. Yeah, Leif, there are a few questions for you here. <clears throat> the first question that came in was, was curious as to whether carpenter bees are bumblebees. Great. Uh, so we will, we will get into that in detail in the fourth module, but no, they are not. Uh, bumblebees are in the family Apidae, along with honeybees, which are, uh, and, and bumblebees are in the genus Bombus. Uh, honeybees are in the genus Apis, and then carpenter bees are in the genus Xylocopa. So they are sister groups within the same family. Um, they look an awful lot like a bumblebee, but they're actually a different set of, of, uh, of bees. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them later. Uh, second question, um, or really an observation, there's a attendee that has been seeing um, Bombus bosnesenskii all winter in Los Osos, uh, California, and they're wondering what part of the life cycle they would be in. They skip hiber hibernation. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, that's a that's an open question for me, uh, and I think for all of us, it's well known in California um, that certain species will stay active almost all year, or perhaps all year. And Bombus bosnesenskii or bosnesenski bumblebee sometimes called yellow-faced bumblebee, that is one of them. Another one that you'll hear about is this one called Bombus melanopagus. Uh, that one, we see it nearly all year on the coast. Uh, it's unclear whether they actually go into some sort of diapause, maybe for a week or a month or maybe less than a week. Um, it's also possible that they have more than one colony cycle per year. So this is just speculation and others have speculated this also. It is possible that the colony makes reproductives in let's just guess like July. And then the, those queens, they skip hibernation and start a new colony. And that colony goes from July to October, November. And so the bees you would see in November and December would be the products of the second pulse. And then they might just go and start right again in the next calendar year. So, so there's some uncertainty there, but you are absolutely correct that we, we can see that species nearly year round on the coast. Uh, another participant would like to know what the difference between hibernation and diapause are. I think we use both terms. I had um, intended not to use the technical terminology like diapause, but that's the technical term for when an insect goes into a state of um, sort of suspended, suspended animation where they're using fewer resources, they're not as active. One type of diapause is hibernation, hiber meaning winter, right? So. Uh, it's, it's what they do in winter time. Uh, some insects go through something called estivation, which is a summertime period of inactivity. So uh, hibernation is a type of diapause. Um, 
a participant would like to know if an individual queen can live for more than one year. Ah, okay. So they typically li live just over one year, maybe 14 months or so. So if you imagine a queen, a new giant closing or coming out of her pupil case, her cocoon in um, August of one year, then she will go through the diapause, start her own colony the next February then that colony might live until uh, September of that, that year. So maybe the queen can live just over one year. Uh, in most bumblebee species, she, she dies around that time. Um, there are some tropical species where the nests can, can persist for longer than a calendar year. And it is possible that the queen herself could live for longer than I was just describing, but um, those aren't very well described. Do guys and males mate with others from their own colony? Uh, the answer is yes, they can. Um, it is not clear how often that happens in nature. Um, we know in lab settings, if you keep a colony confined, they'll eventually produce male and female reproductive offspring, guys and males, and you can see them mate in the same colony box. If they can't leave the colony, that's what will happen. Um, typically, bumblebee giants only mate once. They only mate with one male. That's different from honeybees who mate up to 20 or more times. Um, so there's usually only one paternal parent in a, in a bumblebee nest, um, but it is possible that uh, they, they would uh, find several different males. So it's, it could be males from their own colony, but probably not. Two more questions before we move on here. Um, <clears throat> has any published research looked at neonicotinoids and California bombus? And I, I'm not sure whether they mean um, actual studies that have taken place in California or whether we're talking about California species we might find in California. But um, anyway, that's the question. Yeah. <clears throat> so neonicotinoids are one class of insecticide. They are, for those who don't know, they're <laughs> systemic. Uh, so they're often applied to the soil or to the roots uh, with a seed coat, sometimes to the leaves. However they're applied, they go inside the plant and then the plant translocates the chemical to all plant parts. And so nectar and pollen can be toxic to bees. Uh, I'm not off the top of my head. I can't think of a good example of a study conducted in California on bumblebees with neonicotinoids. But the broader um, answer is that we know a lot about how neonicotinoids affect bumblebees. Uh, there is a whole large suite of negative impacts on bumblebee colonies and individuals that we see with neonicotinoids. And that would certainly include the 25 species that occur in California. Most of that research has been done on two species. One is called the common eastern bumblebee. It occurs in eastern North America. Uh, it also occurs sparingly in the west where it has been accidentally introduced. And then uh, there's one from uh, Eurasia called Bombus terrestris. Uh, and that one is uh, a research model. But so I would just say that whether or not there are studies of California species, uh, we know a lot about how neonics would uh, uh, affect our bees. Yeah, I would just add that the, <clears throat> because it's so difficult to find nests in the wild, it's, it's very hard to measure these things in natural landscapes. So we've typically had to use um, commercially produced or laboratory produced colonies in order to study um, the effects of, of these chemicals on, on bumblebees. And, and that is the reason why we've studied that mostly on those two species that Leith mentioned is they're commercially available. You can buy a colony and, and conduct studies. They're also fairly easy to rear in the lab. Um, so you can rear up colonies of your own. Although I know there are some researchers working in California with, with Bombus vaznesinski um, colony micro colonies as well. And so there may be some studies, but I can't pull any out of my hat either right now, Leith. Uh, last question, uh, what can you say about bumblebee navigation, especially when they are released, for example, by community scientists away from their foraging site? Good question. Uh, we know that bumblebees navigate using, um, they use uh, landscape features. Um, you know, they, the mountains, they, they can key off of larger landscape features. Um, they probably have some other uh, uh, mechanisms for orientation. We do not think that there's any danger in this method that you'll hear much more about later today of catching bees, putting them in a vial, restraining them in a, in a cooler for up to an hour and a half, maybe moving them across, across the meadow to where you're working. 
um, when you release bumblebees, uh, you'll actually see them fly up in the air. Um, in some cases, you'll see them fly up and do a circular flight where they're, they're orienting. They're looking for those landscape cues to find their nest again. There are experiments that demonstrate that bumblebees can get back to their nest if you translocate them somewhere else. So they, they uh, have abilities to find home even if they don't have recent memory of having flown away from home and on a certain route. So I, I, as a volunteer, I, I would encourage you not to worry too much about that. Um, the type of collecting and releasing that you're doing should have, we believe, has very little impact, negative impact on the bees themselves. Yeah, and as a, as a fun anecdote there, there's a, a natural history writer by the name of Dave Goulson who's written a bunch of nonfiction books about bumblebees and other invertebrates from Europe. And in one of his chapters, he talks about some colonies that he's had in his laboratory. And he does these experiments where he drives bumblebees and little film canisters <clears throat> a number of distance you know, from, from his laboratory, I think in kilometers, one, five, you know, 10. And I think up to 10 kilometers, um, you know, they're marked bumblebees and he, they beat him back to the lab. So they, they can navigate faster than he can in an automobile. Um, so I think once you get beyond 10 kilometers, things get a little bit more murky, but it's pretty clear that bumblebees within, you know, a fairly broad radius from their nest location, know the landscape and landmarks really well. Yeah. Yeah, great. But that's a, I think the, the, um, requirements for this project uh, are that you, you know, release the bumblebees, uh, you know, less than 100 meters from where you found them. So, um, but that's super conservative. 